session. I'm Irina Siemens and I'm going to chair the session. I'm going to make sure everybody behaves. So this is a session on Professor Nikolin's book, The Concept of History. The session is organized by the Carl Jaspers uh, Society of North America. There's going to be five speakers whom I'm going to introduce uh, like right before they, uh, their turn comes. Professor Dimitri Nikolin is, is um, at the New School of Social Research and he's also the chair of the philosophy department. Uh, his book, The Concept of History, appeared in 2017 with Bloomsbury Academic. Professor Nikolin argues <coughs> that the presupposition of universality and teleology is implicitly active in the contemporary understanding of history. Thank you very much, uh, Irina. Thank you for the nice introduction. <coughs> and I want to thank uh, everyone <coughs> present here and the organizers. And because names play a central role in my book, I will mention everyone by name. Yeah, so I want to thank uh, Helmut for organizing uh, the panel, Marnie, for uh, bringing this all together. Thanks so much. And I also want to uh, thank the, uh, uh, my, my friends and colleagues who agreed to provide very thoughtful and uh, original deep comments on uh, uh, my book, uh, Jeff, uh, uh, John Garner, Adam Graves, and uh, Sonia Tanner. The organizers asked me to present a less academic, more personal account reflect on the motives <coughs> that I had when I was writing this book. And in general, I take it that it's difficult to give an account of one's motivations, uh, particularly for writing the book, because we always tend to embellish our motives, reinterpret them in a more favorable light, rethink what we have previously missed, and simply miss the most obvious. Yet, uh, I think it's uh, not much of a risk to in oversimplifying my own motives for uh, writing the book. They were uh, actually rather complex. In general, however, before we come up with a claim of thesis, we start with a set of concerns critically addressing the current situation that we find not quite satisfactory. Perhaps, perhaps this is uh, a specifically modern mood or state of mind when we begin with uh, dissatisfaction and critique, fighting uh, out that the social and political, and also uh, as a result, the natural world around us is not what it should be, even if we yet do not know what it should be. As I might distinguish perhaps three major reasons or concerns that made me address the problem of history in the first place, all of which were originally negative. Firstly, <coughs> I want to target against history as teleological. That is, as moving towards an objective pre-established end, which also then would determine the laws of history that we then need to understand and follow in order to determine <coughs> and in order to achieve this end, which will make us eventually free, happy, and even ahistorical beings. In other words, I wanted to argue against history as history for and the history of the future. Secondly, I wanted to argue against the idea of history as universal, that is, as the one in which every particular history, which in modernity uh, uh, becomes the history of a nation, plays a pre-established role of an actor who is meant to carry on the general plot of history. And since, since achieving the end of such a teleological and universal history, is not yet e easy, yet inevitable, apparently. The plot of the unfolding universal history goes through justifiable violence, often on grand scale, where historical actors need to show up on stage, play their role, and then mostly disappear under the role of universal history. And so I wanted to argue against history as an old, incompetent, totalizing history. And thirdly, such an understanding of history takes kind of authority in making political decisions based on the assumed laws of history, which have thus been made fully, or for the most part, rational and transparent. Evidently, history always plays an important role in politics, yet I was uh, really troubled by the way universal theological history was used and often abused to justify modern colonial and imperialistic claims. 
So I wanted to argue against history as serving a political interest of a particular social group. In order to address these concerns that come out of a specifically modern understanding of human action and political practices, I started looking into non-Western and non-modern ways of doing and understanding history since, as I assumed, humans always have always been historical beings, even in the what was later arrogantly deemed to be prehistoric times. To my astonishment, I found a great wealth of such thought, and I chose to concentrate mostly on the early ancient Greek historical tradition, which, in general, I know better. Here again, contrary to the later account of Greek history as coming out of the pen or stylus of Herodotus as the father of history, I found two very important, yet not very well understood early historians, namely Hecateus and Hellenicus, both of whom did indeed practice the kind of history I was interested in. So the resulting kind of theory of history that I came up with derives from reading these historians as well as from the interpretation of the ancient so-called so ancient poetic catalog, tradition which largely predates these two. Now what I eventually came up with uh, through a close reading and analysis of, of the ways of writing and transmitting history is the concept of history that is decentralized and de-theologized by the very practices in which we are always involved, which we often do without noticing due to the spell of universal teleological history. Now, if I'm right, we uh, always live not in one history, uh, progression, maybe regression toward an inevitable preset end, but we are constituted and constitute in turn many different histories, which we differently yet simultaneously inhabit. Each history, as I argue at length, uh, in the book is defined by what I call its fabula and the historical, while we should accept moral responsibility for keeping the uh, historical within a collectively and publicly shared memory, or perhaps uh, collective recollection, we should at the same time take collectively shared uh, political and moral responsibility for the rebuilding and re rethinking of the fabula, which hopefully might then lead to important social and political changes. Speaker will be Jeffrey Bernstein, who is a professor at College of the Holy Cross. Uh, Professor Bernstein's main um, interest fields or research fields are modern European uh, philosophy, classical German philosophy, and the Jewish thought. He has published vastly on the thought of Spinoza, Kant, Schelling, Hegel, Freud, Heidegger, Adorno, Benjamin Strauss, and Agamben. Uh, Professor Bernstein's current work concerns the relation between philosophy and the Jewish thought. His first book was entitled Leo Strauss on the Borders of Judaism, Philosophy and History, and was released with Sunny Press in 2015. Mm -hmm. And he is working on another book right now uh, on Giorgio Agamben's treatment of Jewish thought and psycho, uh, psychoanalytic theory. The first thing to be noted about Dmitri Nikulin's exciting and nuanced study, The Concept of History, is that it is a vig vigorous rethinking of the topic along pre-19th century lines. For Nikulin, history is an in inquiry that we undertake in order to gain perspective and knowledge through remembrance. In this way, concerning the famous quarrel between the ancients and the moderns, he sides decisively with the former. Nikulin construes history as history, that is, as a discursive record of past events and deeds that preserves them from the ravages of time, as Herodotus says. He does not consider the concept of history along the lines of Geschichte, that is, an, as an existential structure in which humans live, work, act, and die, moving from past through present, ultimately directed towards the future. Nikulin makes this utterly clear when he holds in the penultimate chapter, Memory and History, that the future is not historical, but is an imaginary concept, meaningful only within an anticipated teleological history in which the future is already postulated non-historically from and in the very beginning and is imminent in the past, which is then reconstructed in and for the present. In a sense, although Nikulin does not venture this radical claim, the entire modern 19th century philosophical conception of history is the result of what Spinoza refers to in his critique of final causality in the appendix to Book One of Ethics, 
as a mistaking of imagination for reason. Differently stated, what appears as an historical telos is actually an imaginative projection of archaic desires or affects. In elaborating a conception of historical inquiry that refuses the postulation of history as an ex existential structure, Nikulin is able to dispense with the problematic of teleology and substitute in its place transhistorical structural elements, one might even say conditions of possibility, present in all historical inquiry. And these are the fabula, the plot or the fable, and the historical, the factual description of events. All histories, whether we conceive of them as historiological components or simply as the modalities through which we speak or write about events, have these two elements. Put in a more Aristotelian register, instead of indexing history to a final causality, Nikulin envisions it with a formal one. If fabula and, hist and, and the historical are elements out of which history is comprised, through which the memory of deeds and words persists, it should not surprise us that he places great emphasis on the question of names and images as content for historical inquiry. We might even go so far as to suggest that this content has productively determined Nikulin's inquiry from the outset. Nikulin explains how his project arose on the unnumbered exurg of his book. This book originated in a simple question that Agnes Heller and I once discussed at length. If we had to choose, what would we have liked to be preserved of us once we are not physically present here anymore? An imageless name or an anonymous image? We have in this dedication all the components of Nikulin's conception of history in, as it were, seedling form. The emphasis on the past and a certain mode of presence, preservation through remembering, and the question of the role or priority of names and images in such remembering. It would perhaps not be inappropriate to view Nikulin's project as emerging from an Agnes Heller moment, insofar as his conversation with her served as the impetus for the event that is his book. We similarly would not be surprised to find his answer to his dear friend, wise colleague, and passionate in interlocutor's question in chapter five, the logos of history. This logos is intimately bound up with that which gives subjects of history their historical being through remembering. A person lives with a history once her name, that and who she was, is retained in the historical along with the story of her life as a fabula, what she was and has achieved in life. Since historical being keeps a person in a history, the existential aspect or that she was, lived and existed, becomes the minimal necessary condition for historical being. It is the name for Nikulin that acts as the gravitational center of a historical inquiry in order to yoke together the plot and the description of events into a meaningful whole. Nikulin goes further. That a name must be preserved in and for a history is itself a historical imperative, insofar as the named person is saved for a history by and in her name. This is a far more radical claim than Benjamin's statement to the effect that dates provide a physiognomy for history. For Nikulin, names are part of the very substance of historical being. Without names, it is hard to know of what history would be comprised. Nikulin has thus made good on part one of the Agnes Scheller moment laying at the foundation of his text. That is, the name is the substance of history. What then of the image? For Nikulin, images are important but secondary. My claim here is that while images may have normative meaning and be prohibitive, permissive, or prescriptive. In a history, they function as illustrations of an entry in the historical, and as such, they complement or provide a visually enfolded narrative for names. Images for Nikulin provide something like secondary orientation, but no real direction for historical inquiry. They certainly provide no self-evident understanding. To be understood within a history, an image always needs some kind of an accompanying narrative, a fabula, a fabula for which ne necessarily includes names. Nikulin provides a direct answer to the Agnes Heller moment a few pages later. Since a historical narrative is primarily a written text or orally told story, it can exist and live on without an illustrating image, whereas an image cannot live by itself in a history without a clarifying text, 
whether the text is an inscription or developed narrative. Therefore, in history, the preservation of an imageless name is preferred to the preservation of an anonymous image. In a history, names take precedence over images and writing gains the advantage over painting. In this sense, the medieval Jewish biblical tradition of telling and transmitting stories in written form without images, but accompanied by successions of names that are explained by narrative and commentary exactly expresses the structure of history. In this context, we might also mention the statement traditionally made to the Jewish person in mourning upon the death of their loved one, may their memory be a blessing. The emphasis on the remembrance of the named person through recitation also exhibits the structure of history that Nikulin so deftly articulates in his work. We might still wonder whether names function analogously to images in history. Granted, images always refer to named people or events in history. Still, do not names contain a similar self-referential potency? When we say, for example, Auschwitz, does not the name already carry with it the images, valences, and affects that a photo of the camp does? Moreover, in extreme cases like this, like this one, while they are both perhaps necessary to tell the story, do not names and images both face the same problem in their attempting to narrate, nominate, enumerate, and illustrate an event that defies full comprehension, as figures such as Adorno, Leotard, and Blanchot suggest? Finally, what of attempts at thinking history beyond or prior to the designation of the name, as Jean-Luc Nancy attempts in finite history? Regardless of the answers Nikulin gives to these questions, the fecundity of his study will, I think, be clear to anyone working in the now re-emergent field of the philosophy of history. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Jeff, for very thoughtful comments. In general, I uh, wouldn't say that my concept of history is uh, pre-modern. So definitely, as I said, I'm interested in other non-modern ways of doing history or writing history, talking about uh, history. And so I try to look in different places and different traditions in order to find some possible alternatives. I think it's rather critical of modern uh, history. And at the, as you said at the very end of your presentation, so the field of philosophy of history is now uh, re-emerging, which is quite interesting and remarkable because at a certain point it was a very well-established and flourishing field and then it so and then suddenly it was I think somehow coincided historically with the collapse of the Soviet Union or suddenly it all almost uh, uh, extinguished people started talking about the end of history which for me simply doesn't uh, <coughs> make uh, sense at all and so now uh, really there is a lot of interest in philosophy of history but my hope is that this uh, emerging field will try to take into account other uh, traditions which were not uh, immediately included uh, in the uh, modern Western tradition, which I take it mostly originated with Vico after Vico, but mostly in the 19th uh, and 20th uh, century. So I very much appreciate that you mentioned uh, medieval Jewish tradition. I think it's very important. So I'm very sympathetic with it because exactly, I mean, the attempt to preserve names is uh, uh, very, very important. It's considered a kind of moral and historical uh, uh, obligation. So not images, but names. So this, as you say, is exactly my Agnes Heller moment. Uh, I think uh, uh, what's interesting is that you mentioned uh, Spinoza, that be probably your Spinoza moment, as, as you say, the, uh, now I quote you, the entire modern 19th century philosophical conception of history is the result of what Spinoza refers to as mistaking of imagination for reason, what appears as an historical telos of actually, is actually an imaginative projection of an archaic desire of a fact. Now, make a Jeff Dorsey gesture, yeah. end quote. So I uh, uh, think historical imagination is an important uh, topic, although I don't uh, really delve very much into uh, historical imagination or social imaginaries in order to distance myself. Uh, from Collingwood and uh, Castoriadis, who are uh, important uh, thinkers of history, but it uh, might take it really different because, in my understanding, everyone has a history, yeah, and on, not only us moderns. Uh, 
and every human commonality, every culture has a history. If, uh, first of all, uh, history is a multiplicity of histories, and we have it not one general history, but many different histories at the same time. And secondly, uh, that uh, every history is uh, constituted by these two components. I agree with uh, your stressing of the role of uh, memory. Partly what I was arguing with, maybe, and against uh, is, uh, I mean, famous Jan uh, Asman's distinction, which he himself borrows from Jan Van Zina, who calls it a floating gap which comes from anthropology. Originally, this is a distinction between communicative and cultural memory. Communicative uh, memory is more or less immediate. It goes back usually two, three generations, and uh, this is a, a memory within a particular uh, collectivity that you uh, uh, come, that you get from uh, immediate uh, witnesses. And cultural memory is far removed and can be really very, very far removed and become kind of epic and almost uh, the absolute past. Uh, here, however, I, uh, it was already later after I uh, finished and published this book, I came up with some, with one additional, additional concept which I uh, developed to some extent, and namely, this is the concept of collective uh, recollection. Because I, uh, uh, it uh, uh, became clear to me that the concept of collective uh, memory is not quite used the way I want it to be used and the way I argue in this book but quite often is uh, really abused for all kinds of purposes, and you, you, you can see it in contemporary uh, Europe, for example, it's used for very doubtful kind of nationalistic purposes when people kind of collectively remember what they want to remember and interpret their uh, past in line with what they seem to remember. And so I uh, uh, then uh, rather would replace it with the concept of collective recollection, which is uh, a, uh, a recent rational process and in general, I want to stress that uh, uh, reason plays an important role, although not kind of Hegelian universal reason, and uh, namely the reason that uh, allows us to uh, make distinctions and uh, interpretations of the fabula, of, of the narrative, of, of the past. And so unlike uh, memory, uh, recollection is something at which, uh, to which I should come at. You know. This is uh, a, uh, a distinction that goes back to uh, Aristotle who distinguished between memory, which is a state, and recollection as a process. If you ask me what I had for uh, breakfast two days ago, I might not remember. If I remember, I just tell you. If I don't remember, then I start with certain reasoning. And I say, well, I could, remember, uh, I could say that I was uh, in that particular place, and then eventually I'll come to some uh, uh, answer. And so I think that this kind of process of, of collectively shared uh, a recollection which can be rationally established, uh, critically uh, established, which always can be criticized if a, a co collectivity remembers something and this is not quite a satisfactory uh, way to select the remember certain things. Well, of course, we can always uh, uh, criticize this, uh, this account and then come up with what they call the collective uh, recollection. And I think it's, uh, it can play a very fruitful uh, uh, role here. And finally, name and image, uh, as you say, I, I entirely agree, this is a uh, kind of Agnes Heller moment, what they call, is one of the central uh, concerns uh, here. And uh, uh, I, I agree that images can uh, play a very important role in cons constitution of a uh, history, once we know how to interpret them. And of course, uh, an image, if we know what an image stands for, can really become very powerful. Uh, it can encapsulate a whole uh, experience of an uh, uh, entire community. But again, what I'm worrying here is that, uh, first of all, these images uh, that uh, become so emblematic and well known, they tend to be used and overused, and uh, in the end, kind of become almost a device on a coin that it becomes so illegible that uh, everyone uses the same image in, in a different way. And secondly, our c contemporary culture is so uh, uh, saturated with free-floating images yeah. that we simply don't really know what to do with them. I mean, we are really buried under this, uh, the abundance of images, and I think we should. If you want to make a meaningful history, we should so, put a rain on it. Thank you.
I enjoyed the presentation. Unfortunately, I did not read the book. It's one of those things I have uh, things to read. However, uh, I was concerned um, uh, with this issue of the, the role of names, and particularly the example used. I don't know whether the, the example is used in the book with respect to the Jewish tradition, but there is something about the tradition within Judaism of remembering, and it goes beyond just the names. It's also remembering the, the origins of the world and the purpose of the world. Uh, and so Sabbath is always kept as a way of invoking that memory. Uh, uh, but nonetheless, there's this sense that uh, when you do Kaddish and you remember the name, you do need someone who remembers so that the subjective component is very much there. And if, if names are important, then do we do not need someone to, re, to invoke those names for, for, for the sake of memory and a sense of longevity, remembering the, you know, the purpose uh, of the place, uh, but nonetheless identifying the person. So you need another subject. And I want Thank to you. I think it's, uh, it's, it's a really good uh, question. And uh, in the book, I, I, I argue that uh, we don't just need names for the sake of keeping these names, but every name can always uh, become part of a uh, narrative story, which I call fa fabula. And of course, we need to know where it should fit. And therefore, if we recall or recite names, we understand and we know where they fit with. And, uh, then uh, there was a h whole chapter in this book which I eventually took out on the so-called logos or structure on the organization of this uh, fab fabula of history because it turned out to be too kind of almost m mathematical, it's very complex, I decided that people uh, would be bored. But uh, um, yeah, exactly. So we, we, we need to know what to do with these names, how to feed them, so what's, uh, what uh, order, what's uh, succession. Now, the, the whole point of this argument, this goes back to Jeff's uh, question about the relation between names and images, that even if, if you have a name without in, an image, you don't know what it is, where it fits for, uh, in, then eventually you could find a history in which it will become an important part. And therefore, as I argue, it's, uh, it's, it's important to keep them, just in case, even if we don't know how they function, in what context they function. Whereas a free-floating, free image, well, no, sometimes you see on antique markets a, uh, a picture of um, uh, end of 19th century of a family of the person without any inscription. You don't really know what it is, where, where it fits, what story it tells. And it is unless you, uh, we are able to, to provide some kind of story, it will be really lo lost for you. The image of a monument, how would monuments fight? Because you, you still have someone recalling and making the connections, and by extension, cemeteries, uh, and, and ways of explaining, indeed remembering, those names or what it represents, and uh, the role of monuments and, and cemeteries in your, your enterprise. So, so cemeteries, of course, are important. This is a place of memory, yeah. because they're a theater of memory. So when we come to a cemetery, we understa understand what is going on, what peop uh, why people mm -hmm. are there. We know some of the names, and not all of them. So if you're in Paris, you cannot miss uh, Cimetière of uh, Père Lachaise, for, uh, for example. Or uh, all, all these Parisian cemeteries, because I mean, people just uh, go there and, uh, and and see who is buried there. But in, in general, monuments as uh, uh, as uh, uh, tokens of collective memory, they are very recent uh, invention. I think Hannah Arendt complained that in the end of 19th century, more or less, European cities decided to, s to, to destroy themselves and spoil their beauties instead of having a fountain in the square. They always would erect a monument to some king or some, some doubtful uh, character of, uh, uh, of, of their p past. Moreover, I it's only in the 19th century of the First World War that we have the monument of unknown soldier, which is a very interesting and strange case because we rem remember or recall people whose names we don't have. Yeah. And so, despite our best intentions and efforts to bring them back to our history, to a history, we, we cannot do that because we are missing that. This is a question about the example of um, the antique photo that you just mentioned. Um, I presumed you were speaking about the person in the photo, for example, and, and their, the images there, but the name is, is lost and we 
can't really construct their history because of that in a way. Um, what about the history of the photograph at itself in, in the sense that, um, that, for example, that stands for a, a, a type of photography, an era in the history, if history of photography. Um, can the photograph itself have that historical function um, without having an, a name? In general, I think my intention in this book was uh, rather uh, iconoclastic. And this care for uh, images, in some sense, it's a very new and modern. Of course, we know that I mean, there's a whole uh, Christian tradition going back to the preservation and interpretation and veneration of images. But in this respect, I, I'm really more close to what, uh, uh, to, to, uh, what um, Jeff mentioned, to the kind of uh, tradition that really decisively pre preserves the names, and of course, uh, not names for the sake of names, but uh, as a reference to some somebody or some people, or not necessarily persons, but also events or things yeah, that could fit within a history. And here, uh, again, I'm uh, 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 because I want to wanted this book to be subversive of the whole idea of this grand history as one history, as history with capital H. Yeah. Uh, again, each of us uh, really inhabits a, a great number of uh, histories. Some of them are not really even thought of or considered as, uh, as histories, and during our lifetimes we can uh, uh, abandon one of the hi history and sort of uh, populate another history. For example, if you uh, become interested in history of pho photography, then uh, some of you, uh, it, it will be part of your own history. Yeah. That's what I call uh, inner theater, which always uh, is always in, in motion. Right, but while we're on the, uh, the the topic of of the image, um, I'm thinking of a couple examples. I'm wondering if we can think through a couple particular examples that have come up since I read your book. Uh, first, the uh, recently someone passed away who was one of a number of people who claimed to be the the sailor in the famous V uh, what is it VJ Day uh, uh, photograph in in uh, Times Square. There's a, a photograph that, in some sense, has played, I think, a significant role in the historic imaginations of, of many Americans, um, in spite of the fact that the, that the, the individuals captured in it are, are anonymous or you know, contested, at least. Um, so I'm wondering, I mean, in some sense, there's a trivial point to be made about names uh, you know, playing a, a, you know, a, the pivotal role in, in, in history to the extent that narratives are always linguistic. <clears throat> so, of course, how do you incorporate an image into, into a narrative without assigning it a kind of name? But, of course, history also goes back <laughs> further into the past than we've had the ability to capture people's images. So I'm wondering in this, um, in this you know, in the kind of post-photographic journalist world, um, I'm wondering if you can envision the possibility of, of images playing a more prominent role in the construction of history. I understand it'd be hard to imagine exactly what that would mean without assigning uh, a, a name to some extent. I mean, even the history of portraiture, another example that I've come across since reading your book, apparently there's a famous painting by Titian that's on loan right now in, in L.A., and there was an uh, NPR story about about it uh, because it's it, the title of the painting is is uh, woman in the white dress or something along those lines and we don't know who this woman is but um, like the girl with the pearl in earring or something there's many many stories that have been spun um, maybe these aren't histories uh, maybe they could only be histories if we could identify uh, who the individual was and 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 name uh, name her but um, yeah so I just I just wanted to throw that out there since we're on this topic uh, exactly this issue of uh, narrativity. I think uh, played an important role for me when I was uh, writing this book because uh, uh, if you have an, an image, a famous image of this sailor, I yeah, also read uh, uh, about his death, uh, uh, it became such a kind of widely proliferated image. There was a house which was now uh, demolished a, a year ago in Chelsea, you know, it was painted on the wall, all the visitors to the High Line always uh, uh, <coughs> took a picture of it. So I think it was then it proliferated in millions of uh, posts in the social 
media and people really didn't know what it meant because for them it was a kind of attraction came along with the attraction of the highlight then of course uh, later uh, people from feminist <coughs> circles reinterpreted it very differently not the kind of image of a uh, uh, of a s uh, of a kind of ev victory but this kind of image of somebody who is uh, uh, treating uh, uh, the woman he's kissing in a in a way that she shouldn't be uh, have been added to it. So uh, again, every image uh, then potentially comes with a great number of mm, narratives, which can be uh, attached uh, to it. Now, as for the idea whether, because we, we live in such a kind of overly abundant world of uh, images. I was uh, recently sitting on New York subway and there was a young man sitting next to me with his iPhone and he was looking through images, I mean, maybe stopping for two seconds on each one and then after 30 minutes you can just calculate. He looked through hundreds of images. I, want, uh, I wonder what left after that. I'm, I'm pretty sure nothing. You know, what kind of narrative you can tell by, uh, with this. But maybe, maybe uh, you are right. I didn't think ab about it. Maybe a kind of in a Borges moment uh, images might start functioning as uh, okay, there might be probably a semantic alphabet or certain uh, grammar that we could build on them. Maybe we'll, uh, we are heading in that direction, but it's hard to tell. If this is uh, the case, then images will, images will simply s substitute names and will start functioning with this uh, kind of more uh, in, uh, in, in this uh, new kind of history. Our next speaker is John Garner. John is an assistant professor at University of West Georgia. His teaching and research interests range from ancient Greek philosophy to the history of metaphysics, philosophy of religion, continental philosophy, and critical theory broadly. He translated from French. He organizes the Georgia Ancient Philosophy Seminar. Uh, and he has published a book called The Emerging Good in Plato's Philebus in 2017 with the North Northwestern University Press. Well, this paper is um, a response to Professor Nukulin uh, entitled Creativity and Historical Non-Being in Nukulin's The Concept of History. I would like to begin by thanking the organizers um, the entire panel and above all Professor Nukulin for the possibility of discussing these ideas. Let me also apologize for not offering critiques per se. Professor Nukulin's work has for a long time profoundly shaped me with new concepts and lessons. Uh, hence I can do nothing but articulate some questions, ones to which I believe interesting responses are um, quite possible from the book's framework. First, regarding the book's account of the basic prerequisites for history, the preface clarifies that history stems from our, quote, attempt at self-preservation, end quote, in the face of possible non-existence. Certain, quote, invariant structures show up in all histories, and ontological factor factors, like the human survival need, are what drive history's production. My first question concerns this need that appears to motivate us to write histories. My basic question is simply, can the motive for writing history from the self-preservation need, but also from the awareness we have of some kind of non-historical content, for example, content not dependent on being preserved in a historical account or in memory? For example, imagine that we posit, hypothetically merely, some ahistorical truths for example, Plato's form of the three, or the moral law of Kant, or even the invariant structures of history in the book's account. It seems to me that, as a thought experiment, we might imagine a writer of history, let's call her Eve, who achieves awareness of some such ahistorical truth. And as motivated because of that truth, we might imagine that Eve then expresses the truth. Of course, Eve inevitably also finds herself to be mortal, Therefore, she does indeed set out to construct a history from this ahistorical content. She writes with an inherited narrative constrained by a list of real persons, places, and things, but her focus is on expressing the ahistorical content as historical. 
So really there are two questions here. Is the human need to survive the sole <coughs> motivator of the content of history, of a history? Differently, is mortal content the only content definitive of histories? Closely related is a second question about whether history has an intrinsic value in itself. If it does not, then it might seem merely an unfortunate thing that we do indeed write histories. But if it does have an intrinsic value, then it seems we might fall into saying that non-being or mortality, which are history's preconditions after all, also themselves have intrinsic value and should be propagated uh, as well. In other words, I'm asking whether there is a kind of Felix Kolpa <laughs> argument in the book, one justifying the necessity and even the goodness of mortality as part of its commitment to the overall goodness of histories. I became motivated to ask this question because of an extremely interesting section in chapter six where Professor Nikulin clarifies what he calls the historical imperative already mentioned, the imperative to preserve names for the archive. What potentially challenges this imperative, he notes, is the possibility that some forgetting could be a good thing. In particular, the section on oblivion appears to defend the necessity and goodness of certain kinds of forgetting or historical losses. For example, it claims that memory's very function, its very goodness, requires an originative traumatic event, that forgetting helps prepare us for a new start in life. Quote, that was a quote. That forgetting makes room for the higher capacity of recollection, and that forgetting is needed to help mitigate against cases of remembering too many confusing details. Even the value of setting up, quote, arts of forgetting is raised. While I find this section to be the most difficult in the book, I believe uh, Nikulin's claim is not only that involuntary forgetting is our fate, but also that voluntary forgetting should sometimes be pursued as a planned practice. If that is so, then depending on how one reads this section, perhaps one might worry that it retains the justificatory side of theodical views of history. Clearly, Professor Nikulin criticizes any use of historical narratives to defend past atrocities as justified. However, he does say, quote, drinking from the river Lethe allows one to forget the past and in this way to get ready for a new start uh, in a renewed life, end quote. This passage recalls, I believe, uh, Nietzsche's organic metaphor where the genealogy of morality says, quote, the destruction of intermediary parts of an organism can be a sign of increasing vigor and perfection, end quote. That was Nietzsche. Hence, I wonder if there is by analogy an organic sacrificial element built into the book's concept of an art of forgetting. Of course, I do not mean to suggest that the book proposes a teleological history. It clearly does not. But one might worry that it at least seems to propose that we should propagate some historical non-being as part of our institution of historical life. Of course, Professor Nukulin clearly states later that remembering and not forgetting is the task of history. How do these passages on the historical imperative and on the value of oblivion coincide? One way out might be to read the oblivion section not as truly justifying intentional destructions. That is, at times the book suggests the argument um, that the bad of forgetting is merely a byproduct of the good of attentive remembering. Forgetting then might be construed as mere collateral damage. Yet if forgetting is merely a collateral bad accompanying memory, then it seems odd to propose creating, quote, mechanisms of oblivion. So lastly, I have a third question pertaining more loosely to the concept of non-being, um, namely one per pertaining to novelty in history. Um, in what sense is there historical novelty? That's the question. The book claims that while historical narratives are transmitted by involuntary memory, even this involuntary transmission is accomplished by the productive imagination. This power does creatively preserve extant narratives, always with a slight difference, thus making history's transmission non-mechanistic. Furthermore, we may also use our reproductive imagination to criticize and improve inherited history, either through re-narration or through instituting archives or the like. This account seemed happily to leave us with some freedom, but as Nikulin clarifies, freedom in history is limited to, quote, the freedom to create a new history, end quote, and specifically, it is freedom to create a, a new history that retells an extant narrative, I take it. <coughs> 
Hence, my question about novelty is simply this. The productive imagination is primarily treated in the book as producing a new interpretation of an extant narrative. But could there be a pure production or pure novelty that might originally enter into a context or into an extant narrative? Certainly, anything new that enters into a history will be a newness that, in effect, marks out continuities in and differences with extant narratives. But that doesn't seem to me to be the same thing as an interpretation. In short, it seems that I can enter into and impact a stream without interpreting the stream. Thus, it seems here that Nikulin uh, restricts productive imagination to be merely a more spontaneous version of reproductive imagination. Reproduction of extant narrative seems more primary, and production seems to differ from it only by degree. Novelty always and only ever retells. Uh, this last issue of historical novelty thus circles back um, around to my first question about Eve's ahistorical content. Uh, might non-historical content enter into history and thus become properly historical? Um, if not, then might there be some other more radical sense of historical novelty to speak of? Again, I expect that interesting responses to these three questions can emerge from within the book's extremely rich and impressive conceptual framework. Um, think, thank you once again to the organizers, the panel, and above all, Professor. Thank you, John. I think these are really very good, important uh, questions. Uh, the first one uh, regards the topic of historical and ahistorical. I think that uh, history, of course, is important. We are historical beings, but uh, not only. So uh, there is, uh, I, I don't want to argue that everything is historical or can be reduced to a history. You can't always tell a history of any kind of activity we are engaged in, but I don't uh, deny the existence of a historical truth, a ma mathematical truth, for example. Of course, they emerge for the first time always in certain contexts, but once they do emerge, then they can be freely borrowed and uh, part of many different uh, histories. So I take it that uh, mostly as, his historic, as historical beings, our concern is what uh, the ancient Stoics called uh, epimeleia hell too, caritas sui, in care of oneself, so in, in this respect, uh, the uh, question of history or multiple histories that I deal in, in this book uh, has to do with both ontology and anthropology for us as uh, human beings. So yes, m I would say that uh, definitely uh, non-historical should exist. And uh, whether uh, Eve, this hypothetical historian, a writer of history, can achieve an ahistorical knowledge starting with a history, well, definitely she can, because all a historical knowledge always emerges some, somehow, somewhere within a history, certain history, uh, and we could say that some histories are more uh, better suited for the emergence uh, of some a historical truths. Now, the second uh, question is uh, equally uh, important because it seems uh, that it is a bit paradoxical to claim <laughs> that not only a remembrance um, or as I now uh, also call collective recollection, but oblivion is important uh, for history or a history. I uh, think that indeed uh, there is some kind of historical imperative that we need to preserve uh, the names of the people, events and things of the past in order to save them, as Hannah Arendt says, this is her term, from the futility of oblivion, which she in turn uh, uh, gets from the very opening of uh, Herodotus' uh, history. Uh, on the other hand, I think that uh, oblivion is equally important. This uh, is, as you say, uh, m mentioned in your uh, uh, observations uh, to some extent uh, comes from uh, Hans Jonas, who stressed that it might be an important task for us not only remember, but also uh, to uh, forget. Uh, I think there are at least two reasons why historical oblivion is important. One, it saves us from hypermnesia, that we remember too much. Yeah, our contemporary memories are too saturated with all kinds of things. Uh, we also have uh, devices yeah, which record everything, uh, and we never, for the most part, we never retrieve what is stored 
there and therefore we uh, remember too much or tend to remember too much much which uh, amounts to remembering too little or uh, not quite the right uh, things and the second reason why oblivion is I important uh, it goes together with this kind of historical imperative the way we remember it uh, as i said also comes with a certain narrative part of fabula and that of course can change but if it, if it doesn't change over generations uh, and is preserved, then uh, we should still remember uh, this traumatic event, but uh, not with the same kind of bitterness or traumatic experience that uh, should uh, come with it. So in this respect, oblivion might be uh, uh, simply a communal task that people should go through, a kind of uh, a collective, in collective therapy, you could, you could say in order to remember what they have to remember, but maybe in a slightly different way. And the third uh, question about the possibility of historical novelty, this is very interesting and important question, which I uh, do not much address in this uh, book, because this problem itself, and I mean the problem of radical novelty in history or in knowledge, is very important, but it is itself not really a historical problem, so it belongs uh, elsewhere. Here I take it that the figure of uh, Cassandra is really a true innovator because nobody understands her. Uh, the people hear what she has to say but nobody understands her language since others are not uh, ready to understand it and so uh, I think this is uh, the fate of uh, radical novelty. So it's always uh, around but we simply don't recognize it, don't understand it. Now as you said I mostly stress interpretation as reinterpretation of histories, uh, the question whether we can come up with a radically new novel interpretation or not. And this question I would uh, simply remain open at this point, because if you think that interpretations or narrative uh, part of uh, a, any, every history comes with certain genre, you know, the question that is whether we can invent new genres at all or not. It's much easier to invent uh, new arguments in philosophy, for example. But to invent a new genre, I really don't know. I'm not sure that uh, we, we are able to invent any new genres in, uh, in, in, in the last hundred years or so. Another important question is addressing this precisely this topic of radical novelty comes up in the discussion, which was a, a brief radio discussion published by Su Susie Adams, the one that you mentioned in the bibliography, as usual, I mean, the people, when philosophers talk, they talk, talk past each other. But uh, the question of radical novelty is brought up. And then they uh, really cannot agree on it, because the cure, of course, comes out of the tradition of hermeneutics, where all, well, he recognizes there can be new things to say, but everything new is already embedded in the hermeneutic context uh, that are already there. We simply need to be able to extract them. But uh, Castoriadis, who uh, has this fantasy of being ancient Greek in modern philosophy, suggests that, well, Greeks, they, uh, something erupted with them. You know, they invented philosophy, they invented tragedy, they invented literature, something that we are still doing when sitting here, this because, because they did it. But of course, he has the same uh, uh, argument, or, or the same objection could be, uh, referred to him uh, to his uh, argument saying that well they came up with all this but this was already somehow embedded in the in their hermeneutic context in uh, particularly in the fresh tradition of course it comes uh, always with the question of event it's even more it's, for them is a, a revolution it's a historical event for, for them which comes out almost ex nihilo save the whole world because it sets the new standards of freedom for all of us to marvel and follow but of course, uh, you could uh, argue also that uh, it uh, came not out of the blue, but uh, there were some, some important causes and reasons and historical context and hermeneutic con context. The uh, question of radical novelty uh, is, is a very important, interesting one, but as, as I'm saying, it's not a historical question. Uh, I personally would hope that uh, radical novelty is, uh, is uh, uh, possible, but then again, it would be difficult to, to explain it eruption or emergence. Thank you for that. Uh, so much to comment on, not sure where to begin, but uh, 
For me, the something that I'm thinking about in this discussion of novelty and forgetfulness is this new era of digital humanities and the repercussions of that. Because um, it seems that it's all about novelty and forgetfulness, right? New interpretations of history, new things, new fragments on papyrus that we haven't seen, um, using technology to get closer to historical texts that we can actually you know, uh, read for the first time. I see all sorts of new reinterpretations, or not sure how to phrase it, reinterpretation or novelty um, that will come from this era, and also an attempt to avoid the forgetfulness, right? So it's, um, I see both of those at work. I'm just curious what you think, what you envision. I know sort of now going into the future instead of looking back at, uh, I know the book is very focused on the ancient period, but just what you envision about how, how this new era of digital humanities, how it's going to play out for history as a discipline and, and the kind of new reinterpretations. That I have happen. something in the book, I say in the book, and uh, John mentioned it, uh, going back to the question of historical and ahistorical, that I uh, wanted to come up with something like uh, invariants of history, which themselves would be not, not historical, you know, kind of ahistorical. I know that very idea would bother many people who work in philosophy of history, but I, I still s stand uh, by it. And so uh, if I'm right, then uh, any kind of history, a new future history will be able to come up with. Uh, should uh, follow the same pattern, and so they discover new fragments, papyri fragments, for example, or some some texts uh, would simply enrich our uh, grasp on the historical. Now, as for the interpretation of the uh, narrative, the fa fabula, of course, it can uh, change. Definitely, it can change uh, with the discovery of something new. So, for example, our understanding of of, of uh, Gnosticism now is very different after the discovery of texts of Nag Hammadi and uh, keeps being uh, reinvented and rethought uh, all, all the time. So I, yeah, I'm, I think it can definitely can happen. Now the question whether this interpretation will be uh, radically novel or not, and this is not, I'm not so sure because every new interpretation of the existing corpus, once we have discovered a new body of evidence, somehow s makes sense and still comes of the, uh, of the already existent set of interpretations, uh, can kind of reinterpretation. Uh, it's not always the same, but at least it makes sense within the context of a history that all these new fragments belong to. As uh, you maybe know, one of my concerns about your, your, uh, your proposals of this book is that it, it uh, seems to adopt to some extent uh, a model from the from the empirical sciences. So let me ask this question: um, As you've just kind of explained the way in which the fabula might be modified in accordance with the pre-understanding of what's on the list uh, in the historical record, as it were, um, if we're thinking about it along these ways, what's to rule out the possibility of something like um, a, a genuine scientific revolution, a la Kuhn? Uh, maybe the preponderance of, of new data that, that have been uncovered regarding the Gnostics requires us to completely reevaluate uh, the worldview. Uh, perhaps, you know, Augustine's, you know, uh, presentation of Gnostic and particularly Manichaean ideas was overly polemical. And, you know, so I'm wondering if, if you can envision that, if within the context of your theory, you could at least hold out the possibility that there could be these kinds of grand moments of reconsideration. I would imagine that even within the history of, uh, you know, America, for example, we have had uh, instances of, of this, uh, reinterpretations of the significance of, you know, the Civil War or something like that. Um, so yeah, I'm just curious if, if you envision something like that being possible within the context of your theory. Please, so I <coughs> do not really think that what I'm suggesting here is uh, along the lines of empirical science because I'm more interested in kind of more in, in the structures that make a history. A history, one of the uh, reasons for it is that the historical, in my understanding, con doesn't consist of facts. You know. It rather consists of certain items that are recognized as belonging to a particular history. But here I'm uh, somewhat, to some extent, but cautiously side with uh, uh, Vico, 
who says that uh, the natural world is a construction of the demiurge of, of God, of great creator, but the social world and the and, uh, historical world in particular is a construction of our, of us humans. It's a human con construction. This is a principle, what we call, call verum uh, factum. But here I don't think that this construction is uh, entirely uh, arbitrary. Uh, so it is produced according to certain principles that already make sense within a particular uh, history. So then going back to Kuhn, this again has to do with this topic of radical novelty. And I believe that also so so Sonia uh, was uh, also, uh, asking the question of radical uh, novelty in her uh, uh, critique, the, this idea of paradigm change, that new paradigm is so radically different from the previous one that has nothing to do whatsoever with the previous thought. Which again, I think the, even the historians of science uh, have uh, already rejected this uh, idea. First of all, they didn't find the same paradigm change in mathematics, because in mathematics people still, uh, if it has to do with some historical truth, still keep solving the same problems that were already known in antiquity. Secondly, the so-called new uh, mechanics didn't come as a surprise. It was already envisaged uh, there by Philoponos in his commentary on physics because he found a particular e example of uh, throwing a stone, a f stone flying th through the air that cannot be uh, adequately covered by Aristotle's physics and therefore it kind of brewed there so it stayed there, so it was. It uh, it became something totally new. So it uh, gave rise uh, gave rise to new mechanics, but it was not really something that was not was impossible uh, before certain uh, um, dis discoveries were made by by uh, Galileo and uh, Newton and others. Now, in adaptation of uh, history, I think it's definitely should should happen. Because in my understanding, uh, I'm not a historical uh, relativist. I don't think that anything goes in the interpretation of uh, history, that we should kind of fabulo or narrative that we provide for a particular history should uh, be subject of critique. Yeah? And you, it is legitimate, absolutely legitimate to say that this interpretation of history does not hold because it's, uh, it rests on some very doubtful, for example, moral or political ground. But just think of the interpretation of the figure of Columbus. Yeah? who was such a kind of hero in the, uh, discovering new worlds. Uh, and nowadays is uh, um, quite often, I think, rightly thought as somebody who brought all the misery of colonialism uh, wi with him to this land. So definitely it is, it is possible, but uh, again, not anything goes. And if we uh, come up with a new narrative, a new fabula, we should be able to, to, uh, to, 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 to critically explain why it serves. Uh, our purpose of understanding the history better than the previous. Uh, so Adam Graves is an associate professor at the Metropolitan State University of Denver. His research fields are ethics, philosophy of religion, history of philosophy, hermeneutics, and phenomenology. He published on Paul Ricoeur's uh, philosophy of religion, mm -hmm. and he has an uh, editing uh, volume currently under work. Um, the concept of history was a propagation uh, to thought for me, um, and I'm happy to say that I, I had quite a few thoughts in reading it. Um, if I express those thoughts in the form of, of a polemic, uh, that's, I think, because th 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 that particular form helped me to uh, gain a kind of clarity about my reflections on it. So I want to be clear that I, I suspect that my criticisms of of the book that I, I, I sent you in the form of, of the review um, are, are probably represent something of an uncharitable reading, perhaps, but it, it allowed me to, to think through some of the issues I think that your book raises. As we've heard, uh, Professor Nicolin's book uh, takes its, as its target the teleological, uh, universal, and, and political reading of history, which is endemic to the modern period, uh, by returning to Greek uh, ancient Greek sources, pre-Herodotus sources, in fact, and mm -hmm. the book itself is highly learned. It is an example. Uh, it exemplifies the polymathia about which you you write in the book itself. I want to focus on the the, the structure, this this invariable um, kind of ahistorical structure, uh, the, the relationship between the fabula on the one hand mm -hmm. and uh, what you're calling the historical proper. Uh, on the other, the, the list of, of names and, and objects and, and, and uh, events. Um, 
and the relationship between those two. There's a third term I think that's critically important, and that's the logos, mm -hmm. which um, I uh, spent a considerable amount of time trying to figure out the relation between these three things. Mm -hmm. um, it, 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 it struck me as being something of a kind of a Christian trinity. <laughs> the more you think about it, maybe the, the harder it is to make sense of. Um, but I think it is really a, a critically important contribution to thinking about the structure of, of history. And it gives, uh, it, it gives one a lot to think about. To begin with, so looking at these, uh, what I focus on in, in my review is the, the, your criticism of the teleological, the criticism of, of the kind of universal conception of history, and also historicism, because one of the claims that you make, the end of your introduction, is that you reject the historicist account of history. Um, and, and I think I've gained, listening to you here tonight, I've gained a clear understanding of what you mean by that. I think what you mean by that is that you, you think the structure of history is ahistorical. Mm -hmm. um, I, I take it that your, your, your criticism of teleology in, in history is, is probably uh, uncontroversial. Uh, most forms of te teleology in, in, in history either reduce to some conception of the unfolding of naturalistic laws, which eliminates history altogether, um, or uh, in, it involves some conception of providence, which of course uh, we can do more or less without. Uh, although, of course, all kinds of theories of providence have been, have been secularized in the modern period. Nonetheless, what I think is really interesting is your attempt to simultaneously reject universalism, precisely because you want to preserve, I think, a pluralistic conception of history. You said is a moment ago that we all occupy several histories at, at once. Um, on the one hand, your rejection of universalism. On the other hand, on the other hand, a rejection of historicism, uh, because of course you you don't want to abandon the idea of, of historical knowledge. Um, it strikes me that it's really difficult if if we take by historicism if we take historicism to mean something like historical relativism, something like history is understood only ever within the context of history and therefore is always itself historical, then it might seem like this would be a very difficult thing to accomplish. So how are we going to avoid relativism without positing the existence, at least in principle, uh, or as a regulative ideal uh, of universal history? If, on the one hand, a particular hi histories are fundamentally incommensurable, incommensurable with one another, and we lack the means of educating between them, then what prevents history from becoming arbitrary? If, on the other hand, uh, various particular histories can be coordinated <coughs> uh, and connected, which I suspect, uh, which I, I think you, you suggest they can be, then what, what prevents us from envisioning universal history as the kind of totality of coordinated particular histories? That, that at least, is, is how I've understood one of one of the problems uh, that, that your book attempts to provide an answer to. Uh, now, your, your effort to accomplish this task, if I can put it really, really simply and clearly oversimplistically, um, is to try to avoid uh, historicism and universalism by making sure that one foot is firmly planted in fact, mm -hmm. and I understand that you have a particular understanding of fact, uh, while the other foot is is uh, kind of swinging loose in interpretation. This strategy is, of course, I think the strategy that every historical theory uh, would nonetheless in embody. I wonder, though, if in doing this, you have not wound up embracing a conception of historical knowledge which resembles that of the historical school that you obviously are interested in, in, in es eschewing, uh, specifically, the, I'm thinking particularly uh, the work of, of Diltai mm -hmm. and the way in which he understood the historical problem. Let me just read a couple lines to see if we can kind of make sense of them. You say, Fabula, on the one hand, is the realm of freedom where those pertaining to history can keep retelling, rethinking, and reinterpreting the story that clarifies the meaning of the event in history. Um, whereas the historical list, the, 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 what you're calling the historical, is conceived as a sequence or collection of data pertaining to an event which can be ordered according to a universal pattern that can also be arranged and studied scientifically. So this gives me the impression that the reality of the past, the raw data, as it were, is somehow a matter of scientific, empirical, 
knowledge and that the historian's task involves working that empirical data up into a meaningful narrative, which would be roughly analogous to an explanatory theory. Uh, for the historian, then, the reality of the past is like an object, a thing, data points, that remain inextricably hidden behind the veil of interpretation, which at best attempts to rationally reconstruct uh, it in new ways. Now, this may be an uncharitable and oversimplistic characterization of your view, but it does help explain why, on the one hand, you try to separate the historical from the fabula, the facts from the interpretation. And to quote you again, you say, as I have argued, the historical is relatively independent of fabula, and history is all in the details of the historical. And it also helps us understand why you continually throughout the work characterize the, histori the historian's task in terms of reconstruction. So what I want to challenge is this idea that history is, in fact, um, something which is re reconstructed, that, that uh, we have to reconstruct history. Uh, let me read a few more lines that I quote. A fact told by a historian as witness is inevitably a construction, an interpretation according to explicit or implicit ways or rules of looking at things and their meaning, end quote. And if that didn't already make the, the, the point, I think, clearly, uh, that you're clearly operating with a kind of uh, epistemological, perhaps even empiricist conception. Um, you write, every empirical observation is already theoretically loaded, presupposing a certain theoretical scheme, end quote. In fact, you also write, because history is a construction, it becomes possible for us, while still being in history, to study history as an object that may be thematized and systematically, scientifically studied. End quote. So basically what I want to argue is this fact, theory, content, schema, framework uh, makes sense within the empirical sciences, but it's not it doesn't adequately capture what I understand uh, the spirit of historical understanding to uh, entail. Um, and of course, what I want to do is I want to draw from being a hermanoid, I want to draw from the work of, of Gadamer, who is also interested in criticizing, the, in, in kind of correcting some of the pitfalls of the historical school. Specifically, I want to point out that the, that the notion of, of historically affected consciousness, Wirkungsgeschichtlichkeit, the food sign, uh, is the main principal idea here, is not that uh, as infinite beings we are always already affected and thus seemingly limited by the past, but that these effects are themselves part of a dy dynamic unfolding of the meaning of the past, uh, which we in turn seek to understand, and of which our effort to understand is itself an expression, right? So mm -hmm. past events are not past, they are in some sense also present, and our effort to understand them is part of the unfolding meaning of the, the past event. Um, so I would say that, you know, take, if we look at Gadamer's uh, rehabilitation of the notion of prejudice, for example. We see that prejudice is not a, an obstruction to our historical knowledge, but rather it is an essential enabling condition. It's that which, which allows for, makes possible historical understanding. It's not some kind of unavoidable obstacle which limits historical knowledge and renders it mere interpretation. But I think this is, in fact, the, the, the reading that you give to it uh, on page 36, for example, where you talk about uh, prejudice. Now, I want to end by talking a little, about, uh, a little bit about this problem, or at least about my understanding of, of historical knowledge in a, in a way that's a little bit less mystifying, certainly less, uh, less hermeneutical, and didn't make it in the, the draft that I sent you. So it's kind of horribly unfair for me to, to do this. But, um, and that is, I want to talk about what it is that history, the content of history is. Do I have three minutes left or two minutes? Um, and you know, that is actions or, or events. Um, so I want to take my lead here from Anscombe's theory of action description, and specifically from their proleptic character, which he calls their proleptic character. Now, the appropriateness of a description of an action or event will depend on what happens as a result of that action or event. Anscombe observes that though an act is over, many things come to have been true of it. It's a very strange verbal form, come to have been true of it. And there are many things it comes to have been as further happenings unfold. So for example, a wife injured her husband with a thrust of her knife or a nudge at the top of the staircase. If subsequently uh, the injuries that the husband sustains wind up killing him, then of course it would be 
you know, the, the better description of the event would be that she kills her husband with a thrust of her knife um, or a, a nudge at the top of the staircase. In other words, whether a certain description is true of some, and this is a quote from, from Anscombe, quote, whether a certain description is true of some event or action may depend on what happens at other times and places. In fact, since history will, end quote, since history will kind of narrowly focus upon those events with lasting or widespread significance or influence, uh, we can assume that nearly all events recounted in history have this particular character about them. To posit the existence of some beyond uh, these various descriptions, say some bare particulars or real facts of the matter, the thing itself, or in, in your language, uh, maybe the, the kind of non-interpreted item on, on a list, the pre-fabula item on the list, uh, something that would make all other descriptions mere redescriptions or reconstructions, is, I think, to commit uh, oneself to a false conception of what action is. But this insight also, I think, raises certain doubts about whether actions or events can be included on a preservable list alongside, say, names and objects. Uh, or more precisely, it raises doubts about whether one could reliably distinguish between fabula, interpretation, and a historical list once the latter uh, includes such things as events. And if we cannot do that, then the grounds upon which these important distinctions are made begin to slip away, and the so-called structure of history is in risk of collapse. That's, that's basically the, the thrust of my, of my main concern. But let me, let me just finish by saying this. Since I think it's un, the, the problem that I sketched, the problem of somehow squaring the circle, you know, steering a clear path between historicism on one hand and, and universalism on the other, is probably an impossible task. It's the, it is the, the, the holy grail of, 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 of I think, uh, the philosophy of history. Uh, since it's unfair to criticize someone for having failed to solve an unsolvable problem, the most I can do is accuse the author for having tried in the first place. But since I've learned a great deal from his rather bold attempt, mine is an accusation filled with gratitude. Uh, thank you, Adam. This is a really very uh, interesting and provo pro provocative set of uh, questions. Yeah, in, in general, I'm very grateful for, for, for these uh, critical remarks because I think uh, <coughs> disagreement is important in philosophy in, in, in general. I think if we have agreement, it means the end of thought. If we agree on everything, then. Now, if we disagree, then of course we can uh, keep uh, talking. I think it's an, a good question uh, whether this uh, uh, this project falls within uh, uh, universalism or relativism, because as you uh, rightly said, I try to avoid uh, universalism in the sense that I try to avoid um, uh, uh, universal history. That would be all encompassing, where every single history would eventually find its place and therefore meaning. Yeah. I don't want to say this, I, I, I don't want to suggest that these different histories are incommensurable, <coughs> but uh, well, they are simply, simply dif different. And uh, uh, again, as, as we live, we uh, can, I mean, uh, at a certain point, become members of a new history which was not meaningful to us before. But uh, uh, I also don't want to support uh, historical relativism, as I already mentioned in one of my responses. Namely, I don't want to say that anything goes. Any interpretation of this fabula narrative uh, component is fine. Here, for example, yeah, I, I, I don't have uh, uh, TV at home, and when I go to a conference, I always sort of watch Fox News with a lot of admiration. Because they basically take the same things, you could say historical facts, and provide such a strange interpretation, <laughs> just wonder. But then again, I don't want to say that it's okay. So I have, uh, we have, uh, I have one interpretation, they have other, and that's it. No, I don't want to say that anything goes. I, I want to, to say that in fact, in constructing a fabula, we should always be engaged in a critical rational enterprise and argue that what uh, these people come up with in the of uh, events doesn't hold, because it's wrong, yeah? And then we could uh, provide a, a, a rational, could say philosophical or political or social narrative, uh, arguing why our, well, well, somebody's uh, interpretation is better than that one, yeah? And so in this respect, I don't think that uh, anything uh, 
goes. Now, the logos that you mentioned, uh, again, is not a universal uh, logos of history, but rather this is something that uh, comes up, comes with a particular historical, particular structure, organization of the, at least as I said, there was a whole chapter which I took out of the book, which discussed various stretch of various logos, uh, in, in plural, how this list can be organized. So they are not just facts, I mean, assembled facts, they already organized or brought together according to certain pattern, you mm -hmm. know, which we impose on them. And so in this, uh, in that uh, sense, when I say scientific, I don't mean to say that histories, uh, the way I try to discuss them, are really a matter of em empirical uh, science, but uh, rather that, uh, that there can be a certain pattern that can be organized, discussed, uh, and uh, studied. Now, again, when I speak about theoretical scheme, I don't uh, refer to empirical science, but rather to language or uh, a language that would make this particular constellation of historical facts uh, meaningful. Again, uh, <coughs> Cassandra, as I, uh, as I mentioned, is somebody who speaks the truth, but nobody understands it. They don't have the appropriate theoretical scheme by, through which they would uh, grasp it. And I think I, I take it that there is uh, uh, many ways of interpreting various history, scientific, non-scientific, uh, personal, social, political, and so on, that might make a lot of sense and might help us really uh, with a way out of, uh, of a number of political and social impasse. In passes, it's just we, we, we don't have them yet. Yeah, mm. but maybe it's one point will come up and yeah, we'll uh, reinterpret the history or different histories in such a way that it will uh, uh, make for us, for instance, the problem of homeless people that simply become impossible. Yeah, uh, depending on how we uh, understand that kind of history that uh, 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 tackles this uh, uh, set of political co concerns, and then. Uh, uh, what you say about Gadamer is uh, really interesting, and I just, uh, I'm afraid that I'm not really very much in support of uh, Gadamer's uh, idea of history, this Wirkungsgeschichte, uh, or Wirkungsgeschichte, as you say, for a number of reasons. Uh, I think that uh, Gadamer, too, in his turn, wanted to uh, criticize the idea of universal teleological history, and uh, uh, his project of hermeneutics, if I'm right, takes, uh, um, uh, comes out of uh, romantic interpretation, and namely understanding of us, specifically moderns, against them, ancients, and therefore you have to draw a line and exclude a, whole, a, a huge chunk of history uh, in between. So it kind of goes back to this idea of characterization of the model which uh, then suggests that this uh, uh, historical consciousness is uh, really uh, itself historically defined through the meeting of the historical other and is a, a kind of uh, construction. Besides, uh, as you say, uh, it comes with the idea of, of prejudices for Utile, which all in turn comes with the idea of horizons and then the, uh, the, the, the suggestion of, of the fusion of horizons, and I'm really not sure that it exists uh, at all. Uh, moreover, I, I, I think that Gadamer's project is much more open to uh, relativism and people mean to suggest. Of course, there are some people who want to come up with the idea uh, of the right interpretation of the text. Yeah, but Gadamer's own uh, line is man kann nie richtig interpretieren, sondern anders interpretieren. One can never interpret uh, in the right way, but only differently. And so this, uh, I think, really uh, suggests a possibility of uh, more relativistic uh, rather than pl 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 pluralistic interpretation. And now, finally, your uh, point about uh, reconstruction of uh, history as construction. As I already said, I take it that uh, historical facts are not really uh, empirical or scientific. Uh, facts, but they need to be somehow understood, framed within the existing uh, narratives, and therefore, they, in this re respect, they are constructions. But the reconstruction, I think, should come with the uh, possibility of a new narrative. Again, we have the same kind of or the historical uh, 
uh, all the stories, all the facts, all the events, names of people about a particular history. Yeah. But uh, then we start reinterpret them in, in a very different way. And what something that was heroic before now becomes very politically and uh, morally doubtful enterprise. And here again, I want to reiterate that I think that there should be, uh, it should be possible to critically, rationally address a particular interpretation, a reinterpretation. Mm -hmm. Well, it doesn't work for this, this is, and that reason. Uh, this, this is rich material, and it's just so much to discuss. Uh, but I want to try to pick up the line uh, of the straddling between the universal and the uh, and the and the and the relative, because I still wonder how you can recon rec reconcile pluralism with relativism in this adequate way. But nonetheless, I didn't see, and again, I'm, I'm, I apologize for not having read the book before. And I was curious, um, the examples you use of historicism or historicists in the text, I, Dilti evidently is one of them. Were the other names in the, te in the, was Ranka one of them? Okay. And, and it's sort of interesting with Ranka because of that, selling things as they actually happened in the past, uh, the, 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 the empirical thrust, but nonetheless, <coughs> certain th events do occur, and you want to try and recapture that. But at the same time, each nation has unique, these unique facets by way of their own history with language, et cetera. So each nation has a relationship to God, and then that spil spills into the universal aspect, and that theology, you know, the religious, I think he was right, in the sense that the secularization of religious principles were there. But he himself is, is a theist, so that's not an, is not an object. But there is that, that issue of connecting the events in some intelligible whole to uh, account for or to allow for this narrative or fabula of continuity and discontinuity, right? But so that you get the particularistic moments at, at within some sort of scheme. And I'm just wondering how we avoid, you know, what Mandelbaum eventually says is, uh, is still is sort of an absolute position by way of historical relative and with historicism. But with the Ronka example, is that, is that, is that little different than what Diltai does? Thank you. Yes, these are very, very good questions. It was something that I forgot to uh, say I was trying to remember at the end of my response to Adam, but then I forgot. Now, I, 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 rec I recall due to your question, so thank you for bringing me back to it. And this is the idea of uh, historical knowledge, because uh, uh, for Anke, this is kind of positivistic knowledge. Yeah. Uh, Vies gewesen ist so uh, uh, the way it has really happened. We can really come to, uh, I, I think uh, Rank has in mind history as empirical science. Yes, exactly. We kind of very uh, definitely uh, can prove or come with understand that history was exactly the way we now come to uh, understand it. Now, I uh, again, I, I, I want to avoid uh, relativism and my take uh, on uh, the whole concept of uh, of the truth of history, so I, I used this uh, term, truth of history, is rather along the lines of what in, 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 antique, uh, in ancient tradition they used to call a uh, parousia, which is truth telling, you know? which is, uh, means that when I tell something, I tell with the, all of my ability to tell the truth, with all of my might. Yeah? Of course, I may be mistaken. And this, uh, if I'm staying within this kind of historical description and narrative, I, I should recognize that, yes, I'm fallible. We all are fallible. So the kind of interpretation of a history that we now have is fallible. So my, we, uh, or maybe uh, people after us uh, in a few generations will uh, rethink. And that's something that is totally perfectly <coughs> acceptable for us now will become totally <coughs> unacceptable. If you think about all the cases of o oppression that we now recognize, which we were not recognized, I mean, just shortly before, yeah, we came with a, I think, correct, right, legitimate reinterpretation of the same kind of uh, historical that we, 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 we had. And of course, nothing guarantees that we <coughs> won't be able to come up with uh, other things. Well, in fact, when I'm speaking about various forms of uh, uh, oppression, I'm pretty sure that we have a great number of them which still simply don't recognize because we don't have a uh, language, I mean, a, a follow-up. To, to fix it. That's what I'm saying, so the, the uh, truth telling. So I tell the truth to the best of my knowledge, to the best of my ability, but again, recognizing myself as uh, fallible. And one more thing that uh, I might uh, also add in response to your questions and to 
Adam's uh, criticism is the distinction that I uh, trace here in this book, which I originally took from Momigliano, whom I really ad admire, Momigliano. And this is the distinction between uh, uh, the antiquarian and historicist yeah. account, yeah? because uh, the strongly kind of teleological, or you could say universalist understanding of history is uh, usually <coughs> historicist, which means that we have some one leading idea of interpre or interpretation of history as the history or history of the nation or uh, something of, of the kind from the point of which we then select all the so-called historical facts and dis disregard all others. Uh, antiquarian history is, uh, uh, as, as uh, Momiliano right, rightly s suggests, doesn't come with uh, one leading uh, narrative, but it's kind of much more pluralistic. It's interested in many uh, different things that it could amass uh, in the hope that somebody later might uh, interpret or reinterpret them. And so I think that's uh, important to keep uh, in mind this distinction. But my argument that in principle there's nothing wrong with either one, you know, either historicist <coughs> or antiquarian account. We just need to realize that historicist interpretation is not the only one available to us. Yeah, and we should always understand that there could be different interpretations, uh, reinterpretations, in the sense of critical uh, 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 rejection of something that we now seem to take as totally and completely unproblematic. Briefly, but since you were on the topic of, of the truth of history, um, one, one question that kept crossing my mind uh, would be the status, the, the historical status, of a person um, who is forgotten for a time. So, for example, um, a, a person, say Jill, uh, uh, the name is left in an archive. Um, some stories about Jill are left in an archive, but the archive itself is forgotten for a thousand years or something like that. Um, uh, during the forgotten period, um, what is the status of, of the person of, of, of Jill? Obviously, we might say the archive um, has some kind of existence while not being remembered, but does Jill have existence while not being remembered? Um, does Jill have historical existence while not being remembered? John, I, I would uh, say that uh, no. When uh, a person is not being remembered or is not part of a particular history, then he or she or, or they uh, do not really exist. But it's uh, really within our, our power to bring somebody back to historical existence. Yeah? So uh, Asman, for example, distinguishes between figures of memory and figures of history. Yeah? Somebody could be a figure of memory, uh, namely remembered yeah, for a long time, for generations, without any evidence for uh, their historical existence. And otherwise, somebody could be a figure of uh, history, not being remembered. We suddenly discover a new name. I mean, Hotep, for example, was forgotten for many centuries. And now we discover, and it's part of uh, our history understanding of uh, ancient uh, Egypt. But uh, each time that we discover or rediscover this uh, item, which is part of all the historical, as I, as I say, uh, then uh, we, of course, would need an uh, appropriate history to fit it in, and namely other names. Or, or maybe a history could consist of one single name, but the appropriate uh, interpretation of this uh, fabula that we would need to find for this particular name, which is also not always Easy. Rancia, for example, in his names of history, his, uh, I think has a, from my uh, perspective, a utopian idea that uh, for the people of the past who kind of did not leave any trace of their names in history, we need to kind of graciously uh, uh, lend our voice for them to speak through our voice. But of course, it will be a ventricular uh, way of uh, do doing history because then he would kind of generously lends his voice uh, for uh, the people who are now out of history, doesn't really m uh, bring, the, bring them back. But that's uh, precisely the case here. That's, I think, this what historical being is all uh, about. Which, by, by the way, uh, this uh, has nothing to do with this uh, uh, book project, but uh, I uh, wrote about it on different uh, occasions. Doesn't really uh, suggest that this is what uh, our being as humans is. Uh, all about because I, I think that uh, my, my brief thesis is for us humans to be is to be in dialogue. Yeah, we are when we talk about uh, Sonia Tanner is an associate professor at the University of Colorado at Colorado Springs and she's the head of the philosophy department. 
her areas of specializations are ancient philosophy, history of philosophy and ethics, and her current research interests include imagination in ancient Greek thought and the comedic dimensions of platonic dialogues. I want to talk about memory, narrative, and comedy in the concept of history. So in speaking about memory, narrative, and comedy, I wish to begin briefly with a memory of my own, namely my having had the great privilege of being a graduate student of Professor of Dimitri's <coughs> at the New School for Social Research. Uh, Nikulin, in his subtle, rigorous, and careful inquiry, simultaneously understanding and critical, was able to make me enjoy the medievals and to not hate Descartes, neither of which was an easy feat. Nikulin is as careful and incisive in the concept of history as he was in courses. The book toggles between contemporary and ancient sources, from philosophical theory to Homeric epic, all the while demonstrating Nikulin's vast scope and synoptic vision. A central target of the book seems to be disassembling the vestiges of the grand narratives, those narratives suggesting history to be universal or something developing in one direction towards a talos that bestows meaning on us by way of our progress towards it. While his arguments are compelling and I'm personally very sympathetic, I, I wish to ask the question implied by Frederick Jameson. If this view is correct, what happens to the grand narratives? Do they disappear or are they, as Jameson suggests, driven underground where they continue to inform how we think about and act in our current historical situation. In other words, do we not secretly or subconsciously still believe we are making some sort of progress historically? That someday science will know everything and other such grand narratives? And do we not still act on these subconscious beliefs? Further, if we do continue to subconsciously subscribe to such beliefs, does this not itself become part of a fabula by which we can understand ourselves? To what extent, then, does this account of history, inclusive and pluralistic though it seems, itself become a narrative that legitimizes? Finally, is the philosophical concept of history to which the title refers not also a fabula of sorts? If grand narratives become fabula or myths about how we see ourselves, it might be possible to seek an answer to this set of questions in ancient literature. For amongst ancient Greek poets, multiple conflicting accounts occur regularly and appear to have been tolerated. Perhaps due to the oral tradition, ancient Greeks tolerated contradiction, inconsistency, and diverse accounts more so than we do today. Witness Homer's account of the Trojan War to which Achilles arrives as an established and well-reputed warrior despite the fact that the war is triggered by an incident at the wedding of Achilles' parents. Ancient Romans will attempt to straighten out such temporal inconsistency with dates and places specified in their adaptations. I wonder whether we today might truly be comfortable in accepting fabula without such validating details. But there is a literary genre in which we seem to be. And that genre is the one of comedy on which Nikulin himself focused extensively elsewhere might provide a more fruitful possibility. For comedy permits the suspension of belief on such details, such as the possibility of actually riding a dung beetle or founding a city amongst the birds in Aristophanes. And comedy tolerates the existence of multiple competing <coughs> accounts without the tendency <coughs> to seek legitimacy for only one. We might thus laugh at the unintentional comedy of our own totalizing, universalizing, and teleological tendencies. The concept of history is written in a form that supports its content. Its implications are often stated paradoxically and so stimulate us to participate in the historical and philosophical thinking that Nikulin is examining. The book's effect is hortatory. It invites us into the doing of philosophy. Its genealogical approach exposes a variety of discourses that have given rise to our current situation and brings them under our own philosophical scrutiny. We might then ask whether such philosophical cross-examination provides a remedy for inaccuracies in historical memory. In this sense, the book is not, and I quote, a storehouse of remembered things, and, end of quote, but itself an enactment of memory, one of these recollections, as you put it earlier. Is this perhaps how we might aspire to turn our history into a comedy? One paradox cited by Nikulin is that of the necessity of oblivion for historical preservation and memory, and this has been discussed before already. 
Memory and historical preservation, as Nicolin argues, paradoxically require oblivion. Being requires oblivion, much as the shades in the realm of Hades must cross the river Lethe. The paradox prompts questions. If one of the dangers of the grand narratives of teleological accounts of history is that of their exclusion, how does the loss of memory, which effectively amounts to historical oblivion, avoid exclusion? Or does it? For instance, are the forgotten or untold stories of Holocaust victims or the countless other narratives that go unremembered relegated to oblivion? Or is this a role for poetry and myth to literarily remember what was lost and thus save it from oblivion and historical exclusion? Anne Frank may have had the historical fortune, if we can call her fortunate in much of anything, to have her diary found. But would Roberto Benigni's film, Life is Beautiful, also count towards telling a lost story? Nicolin suggests that comic narratives are more easily forgotten than tragedies, which is why history prefers, quote, sublime tragic events and figures and not ridiculous comic ones, end of quote. But it is comedy that proposes a humbler self-conception and one perhaps prone to forgetting or being mistaken which might lend itself better to the tolerance required for the concept of history Nikulin proposes. The concept of history offers us a way to see Herodotus, Homer, and Hesiod and other poets and myth makers as historians from a perspective that recognizes the fabula of history. Literature and the literary become historical as ways of seeing oneself culturally. While the pluralistic approach already takes apart the unified grand narrative, it does not stop with historical narratives alone. On Nicolin's reading, mythical and literary poetry are now included in how we understand ourselves. Comedy, though promising, might prove more recalcitrant. Nicolin's book is an extraordinarily learned integration of disciplines and a vital reminder that history is not done exclusively by historians. A broader sense of history such as this might serve to bring disparate cultures together, akin to what Carl Jaspers suggests in regards to the Axial Age. Cleo, the muse of history, I believe, would be proud. So I, I, I entirely agree that history is not done by historians only, by all, all of us, each of us believes uh, in a history. Now, the grand uh, narrative questions, uh, which I uh, the, this is uh, the question that you uh, raise and uh, I address in this book. Uh, what happens to grand uh, narratives? Well, to some extent, they are still around and flourish. Make America Grand Again, for example. Great Again is one of an example of one such <coughs> narrative. Yeah. In principle, I don't think there is anything wrong with uh, uh, um, grand narrative. I just don't want to uh, suggest, uh, I, we just don't know a priori. It might be the case that uh, uh, at certain point uh, there will be again grand narratives and uh, I think it probably should be fine provided that they uh, hold criticism. You know, it's how some of these uh, grand narratives uh, have been rightly criticized and therefore we do not really, or most of us, or many of us, uh, uh, do not follow them uh, anymore. But in principle, what I wanted to stress in this uh, book is uh, uh, that we, this is my thesis, that we live in multiple histories, each of us at the same time. For example, family history. Each, each of us lives in a, in a particular uh, family history. It's not universal because I mean, your family history is not my family history. Of course, I'll, I'll be happy to share it with you. There's nothing wrong with that, but it's simply uh, differently uh, populated. It's an extremely rich source for, uh, for our thinking about history, about thinking about the way memory, uh, uh, or collective memory works, for example. I think that everyone has at least 20 uh, immediate family members, including uh, nieces and aunts and uh, uncles and children, grandchildren, grandparents, and so on. And so if uh, everyone has 50 uh, years of intensive li lived experience, it's mean that every family history has a thousand years of very intensive lived experience. Mm -hmm. In a thousand years, a lot of things can happen. I mean, this is just an example. Yeah. Of course, we uh, po also populate so-called national history and professional history, this or that, and, and, and so on. Uh, so uh, in this sense, every history is a history, and uh, uh, the idea of grand narrative simply doesn't make sense because it doesn't cover them uh, all. 
Now, the uh, paradox of memory and oblivion, I already, uh, to some extent, uh, tried to address it. And as I said, I think uh, the importance of oblivion uh, serves two, two purposes. One is uh, the hypernesia of, uh, of, of contemporary uh, culture, and the other one is uh, really the remembrance, uh, collectively shared remembering of some traumatic, deeply traumatic <coughs> events, which uh, again, uh, <coughs> if I'm right in my idea of historical uh, uh, imperative, we have to remember, yeah, respectfully, uh, but uh, not painfully, not not going through this utter agony each time that we remember uh, them. Now, the role of Homer uh, that you mentioned is is important because Homer is the one who uses so-called poetic catalogs. He's not the only one; other people do. Uh, Hesiod, uh, for example. And so, so on. Uh, well, you, you could say that uh, another reason that I didn't mention in my uh, presentation at the beginning why I wrote this book was eventually to settle the score with Homer, Homer's second book of Iliad. You know. When I read through this catalog of ships and, and names, it's so boring. You, know. mm -hmm. you still keep going because you know that you have to read it. It's a part of it. And you're happy w when you uh, uh, are through. But I think this is really touches on the core issue of this, all the historical, because each and every ma name has to be remembered. If you forget it, if you strike it out, you effectively remove that person from, from history. Here, of course, uh, also the uh, topic of the relation between the poet and the historian is uh, uh, important, because we know the, this famous line from Aristotle's Poetics that one remembers things the way they were and the other the way they uh, 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 might ha might have been so. Uh, poet is an important uh, I I I important figure in my understanding of uh, history, uh, like mostly because poet provides or can provide <coughs> a particular genre through which we can structure our uh, history. So the role of uh, uh, literature is 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 uh, important because literature can be. Uh, a repository of various genres which might allow us to think about possible uh, fabula, not only history, they uh, basically can come from from any place. But uh, comedy that you mentioned is particularly important for me as a dramatic uh, genre. Uh, however, not only thinking about history, but more about uh, various political and social uh, issues because this is something that I already uh, discovered uh, at wrote after the, uh, uh, this book on about independently more or less on, on the book on on, on history because as, as I uh, said to point that fable of the historical reminds the uh, dramatic plot and uh, the actors kind of they more like the historical which is populated with this uh, with, with the people or uh, concrete uh, events. Now comedy, especially middle comedy, not ancient comedy, is important uh, for me because uh, for me it really kind of provides the example of uh, our uh, collective uh, uh, collective action. Because uh, uh, unlike tragedy, which is about great heroes of the past, of the celebrities, you could say. The comedy is about uh, common people, like you and me. So it's about people. So there we can uh, get much more uh, of an understanding of how collective action works. Uh, be, uh, moreover, uh, like, uh, well, similarly to a philosophical argument, the plot of comedy, of middle comedy, is structured in such a way that we begin with certain complications, then through a complex number of steps we come to a resolution of uh, a current uh, problem which doesn't come as a, uh, as a by a stroke of fate as a death of ex machina, but is uh, resolved collectively by all of us in getting engaged in voting uh, in uh, the plot. And most importantly, the comic actors, uh, not only people like you and me, but the uh, protagonists of comic uh, 
action, I could say, uh, comically understood. History is not a great hero, somebody who reads like, Napoleon or you know, this uh, great military. A hero is but uh, an ordinary person, not only an ordinary person, but uh, people of a lower social standing, you know, who is not, you could never uh, suspect of leading the way, but then he or she is capable of uh, uh, thinking on stage and, be, uh, and behind the stage in such a way that uh, to lead everyone uh, in this very complicated, convoluted uh, manner towards the resolution of a current <coughs> conflict. So yes, I, I, I think that comedy has a lot of potential for our rethinking and understanding of history. I've, I've been resisting, but I have to ask. Um, my wife, Cassandra, I mean, part of the irony is that she understands their language, but they don't understand her language. And if you make an effort to understand it, then you will learn. I mean, and then the other side of that is apart from the the um, uh, the condemnation of being of being able to prophesy and not being realized. But that, in many ways, is the role of the prophet. In many ways, who has insight into events and sees them, but no one really believes him or her. So I, I just wonder, you know, might want to expand on that. Uh, thank you. Yeah, I, I think prophecy is an important uh, genre <coughs> itself that can be very uh, fruitfully used in order to understand and maybe reconsider or reinterpret a history. I know that, for example, uh, Cornel West right now is working a lot on, on the topic of uh, prophecy. Now, Cassandra is an interesting case because when she comes out with uh, prediction of the future, nobody believes her, and nobody really understands what is going on. But later, people learn, and then they appreciate what she has said. But a more extreme case of Cassandra might be that, in fact, somebody says something, and we never come to understand what that uh, person says, because we don't have a language, well, still, at least for, for now. Uh, I, uh, in, in general, one of, uh, of the theses in this book is that history about uh, the past for the sake of the future, but I want to uh, make it exempt of any kind of reference to, uh, to, to the future as such, because the uh, future is, is very I indefinite. It might be uh, legitimate to think about the future in some form of uh, utopia, which we unfortunately, I, I think it's unfortunate that we abandon forms of, uh, th of utopian thinking about the future with the view of possibility of well-being or happiness. Uh, we think about future is only dystopian, kind of tragic. Utopian thinking is, is, is comic, comedic. Uh, but uh, but, but uh, the, it might be the case that uh, currently we simply don't have a language, don't have a appropriate narrative to speak about certain things that uh, we feel that we should speak. You know, that's something very urgent, but still we kind of miss it. So maybe, yeah. Uh, again, I, I don't think that uh, we can know a priori what uh, might, might uh, happen in the history, but maybe in the future we'd come up with appropriate uh, interpretation or interpretation, appropriate fable that would uh, make us uh, really understand what was going on, what is going on. Uh, at the present moment. I feel like I wasted all of my time uh, citing the passages that I found problematic when <laughs> there's so many passages in here that I absolutely love. One of them on the topic of comedy I'd like to hear you comment on. Um, it's in your introduction where you say, um, however, history is not teleological. It does not move toward uh, predetermined uh, natural or God-given purpose or end. A good ending can only be given to a history by us through our shared effort. History is thus not comic a priori, but should be rendered comic by us. It's the should that I just, I want to hear you comment on that. Thank you. Uh, so I already uh, suggested it uh, to, to uh, in my response to Sonia's uh, remarks that uh, I think that co comedy, uh, for me at least, really stands out among uh, other dramatic and literary uh, genres. Uh, first of all, because it uh, makes a good ending or resolution of current conflict possible. And this is a kind of hope that we always have, that uh, through all the difficulties and hardships that we face, there is a, a hope uh, in, in, the f in, uh, in the future. And as I said, so I, I personally find it, uh, um, I, think, I think it's a pity that we don't have uh, utopian narratives anymore only dystopian 
uh, narratives. Now, uh, comedy is always uh, utopian in that sense. It's always envisages a good ending. It always suggests <coughs> that a good re a resolution of the current problem or set of problems or conflict is possible, but is not guaranteed you know, a priori. So we might or might not be able to resolve it. If we work together on stage, as all, all the uh, comedic or comic actors uh, do, and uh, in this sense, <coughs> I, 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 that's what I'm saying, so it probably should. It should be comic in the sense that it should come with the resolution of the current problems that it uh, faces. Because we might have the same uh, kind of historical. Uh, we might sem <coughs> have certain uh, fabulous interpretation of this historical, which might work, but not quite. It still doesn't all make all sense. Maybe uh, later, now, through reinterpretation, through, again, the critical thinking about the possible interpretation, we ca might come up with a better one that uh, might really make new history based on the same kind of historical, with the same actors uh, possible, but just with a different story told. Th there will be certainly the opportunity to give more precise comments, can perhaps in the process of editing the papers and things like that. But in general, one of the concerns I have with regards to the use of first-person plural, when we write history, who is that we, right? Who, who are the us that, uh, so obviously some of the concerns are that history is written by those who have the dominant powers. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, we have some generosity then towards those who tend to be forgotten. But uh, how can we leave out in any discussion of the historical dialogue, the political dimension of it and <coughs> the distribution of powers? Thank you, uh, Helmut, for breaking the fourth wall. Finally, we see you now from emerging from behind uh, the scene. Uh, yeah, I, I, I totally agree that political is a very important dimension of uh, history. I don't mean to deny it. Uh, I think political interpretations usually come uh, more often uh, with uh, historiographic rather than antiquarian uh, interpretations. I uh, have nothing against uh, non-political histories, but uh, political histories or political oriented histories definitely are uh, important because we are uh, all political beings now the concept of we that i use here i use very loosely now i if i rightly remember in a book on dialogue that i wrote i distinguish maybe <coughs> nine different senses of we so it's got to be one of one of them so very, very loosely so we are all the, not those who write history but all those who participate in a particular history i mean this is a very kind of broad uh, sense of we which is not not in exclusive, but uh, inclusive of everyone who is part of a particular history. If it's a history of uh, family, we are all members of, of, the, of the family. If it's a history of uh, uh, the way uh, human tradition was accepted and interpreted in, in this country, that we will be all, uh, all people who lived uh, through it, who uh, contributed to it, maybe some of them became disappointed and, and so on. So we, we are, uh, I talked very, very uh, broadly. Then again, uh, I want to stress that for me, history is not necessarily a written enterprise. So historiography, uh, histories are primarily a written enterprise. They're based on a written text, on interpretation of te uh, text, on the uh, amendments. Uh, that's why uh, 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 hermeneutics kind of falls within this, for me, more within a historiographic uh, tradition. But not uh, necessarily. There are oral histories, uh, kind of fluent histories, some histories that keep being retold, some forgotten. But we uh, should not uh, underappreciate the robustness of oral histories. And some of them are really robust and travel over generations, I mean, for hundreds, maybe even th thousands of years. So I'm sort of very open about the we here. We should say thank Professor Nikulin for writing the book. <laughs> Thank the speakers and the organizers, and everybody is invited in the lobby of the hotel. Of